Chapter Two of the Seventh Sleuths Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Seventh Sleuths Club by Carol Norton. Chapter Two: Snow Maidens. The picturesque village of Sunnyside had one main road, wide, elm-shaded, which began at a beautiful hill-encircled lake and which from there climbed gently up through the business part of the town to the residential, past the orphanage, the fine old seminary for girls, and the even older academy for boys, and then led through the wide open spaces, fertile farms, other scattered villages, and on to Dorchester, a large thriving city forty miles away. Mary Lee's father was a builder and contractor whose offices were in Dorchester but whose home was a comfortable old colonial house in the main thoroughfare in the village of Sunnyside. The large square library of the Lee home was warm and cheerful on that blustery, blizzardy Saturday afternoon. A log was snapping and crackling on the hearth, and a big slate-coloured Persian cat was on the rug, purring happily its content. A long lad, half reclining on a window seat, was reading a detective story and making notes surreptitiously now and then. At a wide front window, Mary Lee stood drumming her fingers on the pane and peering out at the whirling snow. A chiming clock announced that the hour was three, and I told the crowd to be here by two-thirty at the latest. Although the girl had not really been addressing him, the boy glanced up to remark, "'Might as well give up, sis. Girls wouldn't venture out in a storm like this. They are like cats. They like to stay in where it's warm and comfy. Hey, Muff!' The puss, upon hearing its name, opened one sleepy blue eye, looked at the boy lazily, and then dozed again. Suddenly there was a peal of merry laughter. "'Oh, Jack!' his sister exclaimed gaily. "'Do look out of the window. Did you ever before see such a funny procession?' Jack looked and beheld coming in at the front gate five maidens so covered with snow that it was impossible to tell which was which. Merry whirled to defy her brother. "'Now, sir, you see girls aren't afraid of a little blizzardy weather. "'I'm certainly glad that they came. "'I'd burst if I had to keep my secret any longer.' "'Secret?' Jack's voice held a rising inflection, and he looked up with interest. But Mary was on her way to open the front door, that Katie, the maid, did not need be summoned by the bell. A gust of wind and a flurry of flakes first entered. Then, what a stamping as there was outside on the storm porch.' "'Hail, hail, the gang's all here,' Mary sang out, but quickly added, "'Oh, don't mind about the snow. Come on in. Katie put matting over the carpet.' Then, as she looked from one ruddy, laughing face to the other, the hostess exclaimed, "'But you aren't all here. What's the matter with Rose? Why didn't she come?' Then, before anyone could reply, Mary guessed, "'Oh, I suppose her lady mother was afraid her precious darling would melt or be blown away. I don't see how Rose ever gets to school in the winter. Her mother coddles her so.' drives my dear as you know perfectly well but it seems that to-day the snow-plough hasn't been along willow bend lane and her mother won't hear to having the horses taken out rose tried to call you up but your phone is on the blink so she called me peg paused for breath then went on she's simply heartbroken she said she'd give us all the chocolates we could eat and a nice hot drink if we'd beg borrow or steal a sleigh somewhere and hold our meeting out there at her house Mary's face brightened. "'Say, that's a keen idea. I was wondering how I could divulge my secret with Jack hanging around in the library, and I couldn't turn him out very well, as it's about the only warm spot in the house except for the kitchen. What's more, I'm crazy to go for a tramp in this snowstorm. Wait till I get my leggings and overshoes.' They had not long to wait, for in less than five minutes Mary reappeared from the cloakroom under the wide winding stairway, a fur cap hiding her short curls, a fur coat reaching to her knees, and her legs warmly ensconced in leggings of the same soft grey. She opened the door to the library and called to her brother, who was again deeply engrossed in his book. "'The cats are about to leave. We've decided to hold today's most important meeting of our secret society in the palatial home of the Widow Wright. I am enlightening you as to our destination, brother dear, so that if we happen to be lost in a snowdrift you will know where to come dig us out.' Jack leapt to his feet when he saw the merry faces of the five girls in the hall, but before he could join them, they had darted out through the storm porch, and the wind slammed the door after them. The boy laughed to himself, then shrugged his shoulders as though he was thinking that the modern girl was beyond his comprehension. Then he returned to the fireplace, dropped down into the comfortable depths of the big easy chair, and continued to read and scribble alternately. 
He was preparing a paper to be read that night before the secret society to which he belonged, the CDC. The boys had long ago guessed the meaning of the letters that named the girls' club the SSC. Dead easy, Bob Angel had told them. Sunnyside Club, of course. But the girls had never been able to guess the meaning of the boys' CDC. Nor did they know where the secret meetings were held. These meetings were always at night, and, although Sunnyside girls were modern as far as their conversation went, due to their parents' antiquated ideas, perhaps they were not considered old enough to roam about the dark streets of the town at night unless accompanied by their brothers or someone older. And, of course, they couldn't find out the secret meeting place of the boys when the members were along, and so up to that particular date, January 11th, 1928, the seven SSC girls had not even a suspicion of where the boys' club rooms were located. They had vowed that they would ferret it out if it took a lifetime. End of chapter 2